Yeah, uh, hello, my name is Adrian and I'm a PhD student here at SOAS and I will tell you today uh, mostly about uh, certain aspects of the text that is the main focus of my thesis, this uh, Sita Charit by Ramshan Balak, uh, a so-called new Jain Ramayana in Braj Barsha, uh, quote-unquote new because it's not really new at all, it was written in the mid-17th century according to the text itself, 1658. Uh, but Unfortunately, it sort of slipped out of history at some point in the 19th century and hasn't really been, uh, has never been printed, never been uh, available outside the manuscript format and it's only very rarely been referenced in scientific literature or scholarly literature or any kind of literature uh, since uh, then. So a major part of my thesis is to produce a critical edition of this text so that it can be brought into discussion again. So I will tell you mostly about uh, the Sita Charit, as I uh, perceive it. Uh, but I will also talk a little bit about another question, and that is the question of Braj Basha. So when I've been going around talking about this uh, work on, in conferences and other instances, there are always two questions that arise. Uh, the first one is, of course, a Jain Ramayana. Uh, I did not know such a thing existed, but of course it does. Uh, but the other question, that is uh, perhaps more intriguing to me is the question, oh, uh, did Jains use uh, Braj Pasha? Uh, which is uh, not something that is always talked about, though of course uh, they did. And I want to talk also a little bit about uh, why is that so that we do not necessarily see these Braj Pasha texts, this Braj Pasha corpus that Jains really did produce. Uh, so to begin with, I'll just talk a little bit about what Braj Basha is. Uh, Braj Basha, of course, is a vernacular language that arose in this so-called Braj Bhumi that you see around the, uh, indicated there, the Brindavan Matura area, uh, at least in the early 16th century, uh, as a regional dialect of, of this. Uh, uh, All right, thank you. Can use this point. Right, I'll do that, I'll do that. Uh, but of course, uh, in the preceding, uh, in the following centuries, uh, the popularity and influence of Braj Pasha uh, vastly increased. So we can talk of perhaps a Braj Pasha literary culture that blasted far into the 19th century, uh, where if you would use a vernacular language for literary purposes in North India, almost uh, regardless of sect, you would use either Braj Pasha or Persian, of course, if you wanted this text to have a broad influence. Uh, roughly uh, corresponding to the area uh, I pointed out here. But, of course, when we talk about Braj Masha, there are certain images that come to mind uh, immediately. Uh, iconic images of Vaishnava uh, Bhakti poets, like this uh, Surdas, and of course, perhaps even more iconic, uh, Mirabai, uh, which is, of course, broadly uh, famous, and especially in connection to both poets, uh, the image of uh, Krishna, the flute playing uh, young cowherder boy and uh, adolescent in uh, the Braj Bhumi. Uh, but still, Jens also produced Braj Basha poetry. And of course, the uh, most famous example is Banarsidas, the 17th century merchant of Ardakatanaka fame. Uh, of course, one of the uh, only uh, full autobiographies in pre-modern South Asia. A fantastically interesting text. And of course, also his commentary on Kunda Kunda, uh, the, uh, the collective author, uh, uh, which are both influential and important texts. And of course, other Jain poets in Braj Pasha existed and have been worked on, uh, but still, we are only scraping the surface of what is there, and especially when it comes to the genre of narrative, of big epic narratives in the same sense as Tulsidas, the Ram Charitmanas, the Avadi retelling of the Ramayana. These are less familiar to us. And uh, when I started canvassing uh, my uh, thesis, uh, I came into it as primarily a student of uh, early modern North Indian literature. And then uh, I came across this quote in the history of Hindi literature on the Sita Charit. And uh, this really, of course, made me curious about uh, what this text could be like. And of course, also knowing that this is not the only uh, uh, epic of its kind produced by a, a Jain in Braj Basha. So, 
uh, many kinds of questions came to my mind, uh, such as who is this Ramshan Bala who wrote this? Uh, what can we know about him? Is there even possible to know anything? Uh, but perhaps more importantly, uh, why is it that this Sita Charit is said to be significant, and yet there uh, is hardly any knowledge about what it actually contains in the modern era? Uh, is it really significant? Maybe it isn't. Maybe it's received knowledge. And anyway, why is it so obscure? Why is it that a text can be thought of as being significant and important and all of these things, and uh, still uh, it has never been printed, it's never been accessed uh, in modern days? So I started by looking at manuscripts around India, and this is just the selections of the manuscripts I found. So these, uh, these are spots, they indicate not a single manuscript, but they indicate sites that I even accessed, either accessed or that I sourced manuscripts from where there were multiple, complete manuscripts of the text. Uh, and these manuscripts come in different kinds of shapes, they look different, and they spread from the earliest one I found was from AD 711, and the young, earliest one is, uh, uh, oh, the most recent one, is from the mid-19th century. So given that the uh, text was composed in the mid-17th century, we have a, a provenance of this text's popularity across uh, great parts of central and western India before it then faded into relative obscurity. Uh, so what we can say about it, looking at what is in it, is of course on a very uh, factual basis, it's about 2,500 verses long, corresponding to roughly 200 pages in manuscripts, which is quite a bit. It is a long, it is a long work. Uh, in terms of religious outlook, Balak is very clearly a Digambara. He speaks very uh, passionately about the beauties of Digambara Jainism. Uh, he is also uh, aligned with the broader Adhyatmic movement that uh, Banashtidas uh, is seen as one of the main inaugurators of, uh, in that he deeply values uh, wisdom, insights, and the transformative power of this kind of insight. Uh, on the other hand, he is also very uh, uh, preoccupied with bhakti, uh, bhakti towards the teachings of Jainism and also bhakti towards those individuals uh, who have successfully managed to live by the teachings of Jainism. Uh, I will not talk so much about the religious aspect or the Jain aspect as such here, but more about what I perceive to be a very original uh, narrative structure in this work and also a very original or at least thought provoking form in terms of aesthetics. Uh, so, uh, this uh, badly formatted uh, Devanagari is sadly courtesy of PowerPoint. There's nothing I can do to help it. So, please imagine the short ease uh, properly aligned. Uh, but in terms of narrative structure, this is the first actual uh, narrative segment in the text uh, that actually mentions what is happening, goes beyond benedictions. And you see that it basically tells the Ramayana. Uh, so, it begins uh, with what is already there and begins then at the ending, uh, with Sita and Ram returning back to Ayodhya after the actual fact. Uh, and then it goes into a detailing of how uh, uh, various kinds of slander start arising amongst the, the populace of Ayodhya, and how Ram eventually determines that the only way forward is to, of course, Sita's banishment or bandas, uh, to which uh, he uh, tasks a commander in the army to say, take her to the forest and tell her that she's going to stay, uh, going for puja in, Chinuma, in Jain Mandirs, uh, and then drop her off. And uh, uh, of course, when they arrive in the forest, Sita responds to this uh, situation with a show of great uh, stoicism and with a great uh, faith in, in the... In the in the importance of not abandoning dharma, uh, and uh, makes a case that the commander should not feel sad about what he is doing, neither should one blame Rama. This is all the uh, effect of a crude karma. Uh, and so she uh, gives a speech uh, that uh, culminates with what is uh, a sort of a, uh, an encapsulant of what she sees to be the so-called good nature of the sati, of the devout chain laywoman. Uh, to which the commander returns very impressed back to court and relates the story that is heard to Ram, who is then most dejected and very sad. From there, uh, the story, of course, follows the birth of the two twins of Sita and follows them into adolescence, where they meet Narada, the sage, uh, who references Ram to them, 
mentioned SIM, and they, haven't, they don't know about their lineage, so they ask uh, uh, Raptor, please tell us more. And then Narada begins telling everything that's happened so far, and then he tells the Ramayana to the boys. Uh, and he tells the Ramayana then that it's very focused on what individual characters in the story are doing. It, fo it focuses on how characters like Bharata uh, and Ravana, uh, how they handle situations where uh, the, uh, the doctrines of Jainism, the uh, laws and rules of how one should le lead a Jain life, clashes with the dilemmas they find themselves in. At the end, the story returns to, where, to the narrative presence of the story, uh, with Narada telling the story to the boys. It's over, and then they move back into the present story, uh, present tense of the story, where uh, Ram uh, uh, finally meets Rab the two boys, Lavan and Kusha. They have a big uh, uh, reconciliation and recognition scene. Sita, of course, rejects following back into Ayodhya, but rather uh, takes renunciation. Uh, Ram asks her, uh, before he leaves, this final question, uh, are you angry with me? And then Sita gets the last uh, comment in the actual narrative, uh, in this very quote-worthy encapsulation of, uh, of uh, what is uh, Jina Dharma Abhyasa. Uh, so this, uh, this narrative uh, structure, uh, of course, we heard Eva talked yesterday about the, uh, uh, the Jain Ramayanas, and of course there is uh, a tendency to see them, of course, as these stories, these Puranic stories about how Ram and the other characters figure into the larger cosmological framework of the Trishashti Shalaka Purusha trait and all of these things. Uh, but in the Sita Charit, then, it is all uh, reconfigured and refocused so that we see the story of the Ramayana through the lens of the prison of Sita as the paradigmatic Jane character. She is the benchmark that all of the characters in the story are judged against, and it finishes off in a hymn of praise to the asceticism of, of, of Sita. Uh, so, this is a striking narrative structure uh, that is also similar to what is called the Sati Kata uh, te version uh, genre of stories. Stories about uh, Satis of devout Jain uh, laywomen and their provenance. Here is an example of uh, a 19th century manuscript. I believe it is a 19th century, uh, found in Jaipur, uh, the Sita Pachisi, uh, which also does exactly the same thing. It, tells only the story of Sita's uh, Vanvas uh, and drops the entire, the rest of the Ramayana and only focuses on her response to that situation. Uh, so the Sita Charit is similar, uh, except that of course it includes the entire Ramayana as a subplot to the major plot of, of Sita in the forest. Uh, at the same time it also has the Sita Charit a striking style, I'd say. It has, uh, as you maybe have seen already in the quotes I've given to you, it's a colloquial tone that is quite endearing and quite fascinating. Uh, this is a good example, of course, when uh, Lavan and Kusha leave for, uh, for war and they tell, uh, tell Sita, Mataji uh, Hamshalte, which is, of course, uh, not something you see very often in ornate metrical poetry from the 17th century, this kind of uh, of almost modern sounding phrases. And this is the aspect that I've had the most feedback on when I've shown aspect elements or the samples from this text at seminars uh, around the world. Uh, a, a, following, a, a similar uh, example is, of course, this uh, initial response from Sita when uh, she is dropped off in the forest with the wonderful phrase, Isavaname kiakam, iha kaujina mandinehi, kayoka hatumaram, which uh, has, has the sort of clipped phrasing of actual speech, right? Uh, but that doesn't mean that it's not uh, on it or that the other things were not available to the poet. You see, uh, this is a sample when Mandodari, Ramana's wife, uh, tells him that he is currently blinded by his uh, passions for Sita in this beautiful imagery of uh, you are like a lion that sees its reflection in a well and in its furious anger doesn't see the full picture. Uh, which, is, uh, which is, I think, beautiful and striking, but still also captured in this quite uh, straightforward language. Uh, normally, we only see this kind of, uh, of, uh, of straightforward colloquial language in Braj Pasha in prose texts, but the Sita Charit is not a prose text at all. 
<laughs> As you see here, this is uh, uh, the uh, first page of one of its manuscripts. And you see, uh, I've indicated all the metrical changes. Uh, and this is only the first page. Uh, in comparison, here are two uh, other uh, early modern Ramayana stories. On the left, you have uh, the Sita Ramchopai in early Gujarati by the Shvetambara uh, Samaisundar. Uh, this is, of course, an extreme example, but you see that it, it follows uh, the same metrical pattern uh, throughout in this, uh, in this random sample. Uh, and on the other hand, you have Ram Chandrika by the courtly poet Keshavdas, who is, of course, famous for perhaps being the courtly poet of Keshavdas, uh, of, of Brajbasha, uh, an aesthetic uh, genre or format which uh, values the pyrotechnics of advanced metrical usage. And you see uh, how often he changes between meters in telling a quite straightforward story from the uh, Ramayana. Uh, so the Sita Charit is closer uh, to this than to this in its uh, structure, or in its metrical uh, complexity. Yet at the same time, uh, this uh, Riti poetry is also typically uh, full of heavily adorned kavya, alankaras, uh, and very complex aesthetics, which then the Sita Charit, as we have seen, doesn't really use. Uh, so what we can say about it then is that I see that it contains a very creative refocusing of a familiar narrative. Uh, and it also has a high degree of metrical variation, and it, while at the same time using this unadorned language for its effect, which places it in a sort of uh, slightly unexplored space in it, the broader context of early modern North Indian literary culture, where you often think in terms of uh, bhakti uh, poetry, and, uh, which is uh, uh, songs and hymns and quite straightforward, and at the other hand you have this advanced courtly poetry. Uh, this is a bit of both, right? Uh, so uh, the other question I wanted to then bring up a bit is why is a text like this so obscure, right? Why, is it, why has it never been printed? Uh, why has it, not been, has it not been available? And when I went out looking for manuscripts, of course, I found a lot of different uh, texts in a similar way, also in Rajbasha, also written in the 17th and 18th century, that for the most part I have not been able to find uh, printed editions of. So, I find, and this is not uh, a kind of uh, uh, accusatory uh, exercise, but I just want to point to two uh, wider narratives uh, that I think often guide the way we approach Brajbasha uh, and literary culture. And of course, on the one hand, it's this all pervasive influence of uh, the Vaishnava impression and the so called on the Bhakti movement. In this narrative, of course, uh, bhakti in North India really, really took off with the rise of, uh, of devotional Krishna poetry in Braj uh, And of course, with time, this has seeped into the wider uh, project of nationalist historiography, I'd say, in that it is proto-Indian uh, nationalism, and it is proto-Hindi, and it is a proto-modern uh, Hindu identity. Uh, and within this narrative, of course, the kind of riti poetry, the kind of uh, courtly aesthetics, uh, aesthetics that Keshavdas, for instance, uh, uh, stood for, is seen as a kind of decline, as, uh, as, uh, as aestheticism gone berserk, right? Uh, and but of course, within this, uh, this scheme, uh, there is, first of all, not so much space to recognize the influence of, uh, of Persian Sufi romances on the narrative writing of this period. And of course, there's very little space for Jains. Right? Uh, so that is one narrative to be uh, aware of. Thanks. And uh, the other uh, aspect, or the other uh, question is, of course, the idea of Brajbasha, or vernacular in general, as a kind of lesser uh, language. When I say lesser, I mean uh, as we see in this uh, quote by the uh, fantastic study of Jain Ramayana's by Kulkarni, where at some point he also lists some of the more recent early modern texts and uh, suggests that they probably do not contain any uh, new remarkable features but repeat in their own language what the older Jain writers have already said, of course, in Sanskrit or Prakrit. Uh, but at the same time, we all know that uh, the secret of a good story is uh, not so much uh, the actual content, but it's how you tell it, right? Uh, so it's not necessarily, uh, even though it might be a translation or it might be a retelling, uh, 
it might be something else going on at the same time. And Bryant and Hawley have both worked uh, thoroughly on the body of poetry by the Bhakti poet Surdas, where they find that the effect of that poetry, its aesthetic effect, its devotional effect, its brilliance in other way, doesn't come from the fact that he's introducing the team of Krishna to uh, an audience that had never heard about it before. It, becomes, it is because he references these teams that are familiar to them already, and he does so in highly uh, ingenious ways. For instance, in, a, in one of his poems, uh, where he referenced the story where one of these, is it a cloud demon that comes in while Krishna, the son, the, the, the baby boy is playing. And of course he ends with just a picture of a cloud coming in over the courtyard. And then everybody is free to, uh, to reference the story that they know is coming, but the image stays. And that's the important thing in that kind of poetry. Similarly, uh, to uh, mention uh, something more local, uh, London in, uh, in, of course, the same period, in the early modern period, uh, where you had the first production of Hamlet uh, here on stage. Uh, recent Shakespeare scholarship has emphasized that uh, uh, prior to Shakespeare's Hamlet, uh, it, his own company had already produced two different versions of the Hamlet already. So the complexity of Shakespeare's Hamlet is of course then partly stemming from the fact that he could count on absolutely everybody who came to see it, that they already knew the story. And I think it is along similar lines that we should approach uh, this uh, early modern narrative uh, literature. And I think that is also a way to uh, see uh, the actual real and, uh, and substantial uh, 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 impact of Jain Brajmasha literature uh, to uh, the wider literatures of early modern North India or South Asia in general. So I'll uh, end with that and I'll just uh, bring on this uh, message from Ramchan Balak and uh, that was it. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to talk about a to total different matter. It's more about, I hope the change is not too cold because after this nice stories, um, oh, this, after these nice stories, um, I'm going to talk about digital texts. Um, the topic of my talk is a bundle of programs. Sorry, this one is, I have to stop this from running. Um, can you help me with that? Um, how do I stop this? Stop it from um, from from going forward? Yeah. You want to stop it on this? Frame? Yes, just on the box. Okay, okay. Sorry about that. Um, the top uh, the. Um, the topic of my talk is a bundle of programs, a website, which is publicly accessible at the internet location dpal.org. Under this address, I maintain two websites which pertain to the Indological research areas, history of Indian philosophy and China studies. The word Deepal in the internet um, address is an acronym for the common title of the two sites, which reads the Gambara philosophers in the age of logic. The title reflects an influential periodization of K.K. Dixit, who in 1971 coined the phrase Age of Logic for the literary epoch, beginning with the Tatvata Sutra and ending with Yashavijaya. What Dixit had in mind with the phrase was the era of the production of the Jaina Sanskrit literature on doctrine, ontology, epistemology, logic and emancipation. The first site gathers historical information on this epoch its authors, their works, lifetimes, social relations, and the loca locations of their activity. The setting, second site is dedicated to the oeuvre of one of these authors, the 10th century Digambara Vidyanandin. I have already presented the bio-bibliographical site here at the SOAS and will present today the digital corpus only. In my presentation, I will first demonstrate the search function of the site. I will then outline some criteria to assess the quality of digital resources. And before the backdrop of these criteria, I will finally look at the current stage of the development of the corpus. So that's 
the next 20 minutes. <laughs> Several works have been ascribed to ancient China Acharyas by the name of Vidyanandin. There is a scholarly consensus that these nine Sanskrit works are the extant works of a single person of the 10th century, of the Common Era. These works have often been described to represent a culmination of classic China philosophy. In them, the author enlarged upon ideas and arguments of Samantha Bhatra and Akalanka and engaged in a detailed debate with proponents of other traditions of Indian thought. It is worthwhile to know for historians of Indian philosophy or of China thought if a particular term, phrase or argument appears in these works. In their entirety, these works are quite voluminous. They add up to 1,000 pages in the editions I use. Electronic versions of these editions can now be searched in the following way. You have here a screenshot of the site. To the left is the main content, to the right the navigation menu. This particular list of works is found under the main navigation item, Works. Searches can be entered after clicking the link search or by directly entering a term in the quick navigation field to the upper right. As a first example, I enter the infrequent word Guha in the quick navigation field. By clicking on the search icon, the program searches and arranges the result like this. The first block repeats the input of the search. The second block contains a short summary of the results. That is, the number of occurrences, we have five in this example, the unique matches here, Guha and Guha, and the sigla of the works where the matches occur. Here the Ashta Sahasri, the Shratya Shasana Pariksha, and the Tatva Arta Shloka Vatika. The second line of this block gives information on how the results are displayed and ordered. Here in form of a so-called concordancer, in which the unique matches are given as headers, followed by page and line references within the work indicated by the siglum. Sorry. There's one missing, right? Anyway, the um, patent line references are to the left here. And the context in which the match appears. You will have noted that the search input was Guha, but the found unique matches are Guha and Guha. This is an optional feature of the program in which some Sunday variations and orthographic variations are also searched. These options are useful if the number of results is small. For example, if the occurrences of, if the, occurrences of the name Samantha Batra are searched. Here, five unique matches are procured. Two of them include orthographic variation for the nasal before dental tenures. The matches with the final vowel long A in the search expression emerge due to a Prashlishta Sandhi. Final O comes as a coincidental, coincidental extra for another Prashlista Sandhi, not for the Sandhi as, if as, before o, uh, as becomes O. Another optional feature is the disregarding of spaces in the search expression. The program operates on electronic text in which the transliterated Sanskrit text is not standardized with regard to the segmentation of syntactic elements. The program catches this by looking for matches with and without spaces. A search for Tata He Budi will thus procure matches with and without space between Tata and He. For exact searches, the standard setting needs to be deactivated. A search for Vadam, for example, procures too many matches in the standard setting. By deactivating the options, a meaningful result is achieved. Speaking of too many results, with the display option counter, um, the, the, the results are just listed according to the number of occurrence. With the display option index, the results are listed only with the references without the context. 
As a final feature of the demonstration, I want to refer your attention to searches within a certain range of characters. In the standard setting, a search for nano ET will yield no result. This behavior can be changed by modifying the standard options and allow for a range. That is, an interval of arbitrary characters between the elements in the input field. If range is set, the search will procure text which is contained by the respective terms With searches like this, quoted elements can be identified, like the colored instances here. This is useful, but the example also shows that limitations of this, the limitations of this approach. The string nanvum is not the element we are looking for, and the string et and vt is not the quotative. A human reader can identify this, but the program needs to be told by a markup of the distinction in the source file. Here the challenges begin. What, for that matter, are the textual sources for this program, and to what extent is the procured text reliable? I will answer these questions after a short characteristics of digital resources, to which I come now. I have mentioned in passing earlier that the demonstrated program relies on electronic versions of editions. Two decades ago, ago the name e-text was introduced for such digital copies. With the digital humanities meanwhile being an established academic discipline, a more distinct notion is in place, especially if one attempts to produce and maintain good electronic versions of ancient texts. I call the copies and questions digital text resources and transformations of digital text resources. What is a digital text resource? What its transformation? Contrary to a digital image resource, a digital text resource can be operated by a machine. More precisely, in a digital text resource, the text of a particular attestation of a work can be extracted from surrounding metatext without further ado. Compare this excerpt from an edition of the Abdemimansa with this excerpt from an electronic text of the same edition kept in the Gretel text repository. We know that we can open the Gretel text file in a word editor and search for textual bits, whereas with the PDF file we cannot do so. The fundamental criterion for a digital text resource is such the operationality of the text by an electronic program. This criterion can get into conflict with the criterion readability for humans. Gacha Daralal's edition was optimized for readers of Devanagari to take in the text without effort. A reader who is not used to transliterated Sanskrit may even find a simple digital text resource like this annoying. Readability gets a prominent issue before the backdrop of another criterion for the quality of a digital resource digital text resource, namely the separation of text and metatext. The elements highlighted here are metatext and need to go away when the mere text is to be extracted. Today's standard for a neat separation is XML markup. An excerpt of a digital text resource with the first verse of the Abdemimasa looks like this. Well, whatever the necessities for operationality by machines, such resources need to be transformed in order to make them readable for humans again. A further criterion is the quality of the capture. That is, the quality of the text with regard to the captured source. Such a criterion applies also to digital image resources. This digital capture is better than this. The former is better in the sense that the later is a bit blurred. Similarly, one textual resource can contain more typing errors than another. Quality of the capture translates here to reliable input of the actual source. With this criterion, we are, however, entering the realm of edition proper. 
Will I repeat every misprint of the captured printed edition? Or will I correct errors silently for the sake of operationality by the machine? Certainly not. This is exactly why the e-text got a bad ring to its name. All text written notes were erased in order to facilitate the search of the text. But technology has advanced and strategies to document variations of the text of a work are a decisive criterion for the quality of an up-to-date digital text resource. The documentation of variance is a form of annotation or enrichment of the digital resource. The kind of enrichment depends on the interest of the compiler. For example, many of you will be familiar with the digital corpus of Sanskrit, which operates on XML files that are extensively tagged with markup pertaining to Sanskrit word forms. The criterion for quality with regard to enriched text resources is the application of a consistent vocabulary for the metatextual elements. All idiosyncratic metatext terminology is not sustainable in the long term. The de facto standard for cons consistent markup in philology today are the conventions of the text encoding in initiative. Very great, very prominent in Britain. Um, the TI consortium offers a fully differentiated vocabulary for the description of various textual features. Of special, of special interest for my project are the TI guidelines for default text structure, critical apparatus, or names, dates, and peoples. The best practice example, example I know of in the field of digital ideology for the strict adherence to TEI conventions is the SARIT project. SARIT is expressively dedicated to the production of digital editions of Indic texts. The project is especially noteworthy with regard to the clear identification of individual textual resources, their collection in a corpus, and the documentation of the responsibility for revisions. I summarize the outlined criteria. If one is assembling digital text resources in a corpus, decisions made with regard to these criteria are frequently subject to consideration and reconsideration. The resources are to be operated by a program, but which, which technologies are to be used precisely? Text and metatext are to be neatly separated, but the distinction is not always clear. What about Sandhi and interpunctation? Do they belong to the text, or do, they ref or do they reflect a decision of the editor, like titles and headers, and are therefore metatext? <coughs> the quality of the captured text may be satisfactory for one particular attestation, but what about the other attestations of a work? When do manuscripts come into play? Compliance to the TEI convention is fine, but this convention is not the last word on every aspect of textual analysis. I cannot elaborate on this now. In my remaining time, I will roughly sketch the current stage of development of Vidyanandin's corpus before the background of the outlined criteria. I get back to the questions left answered earlier, left unanswered earlier. What are the sources for the demonstrated search program and to what extent is the procured text reliable? The sources for the search program are seven digital resource files in which text and metatext are stored alongside each other. One of them looks like this. With a bundle of technologies, these individual resource files are transformed in basically two ways. In the first type, the resource is purged from all metatext and the plain text is fed to the search routine. To the human eye, such plain text looks like this. In the second type of transformation, the metatext is used to render the text of the captured edition together with its editorial features. Such a transformation, transformation looks like this. This is the beginning of the text and the notes are displayed like this. The reliability of the rendered text and of the text procured in the search program depends on the following factors. The quality of the captured edition, 
measured by an overall impression of the consistency of the text, the quality of the capture measured by conformity to the captured edition, the number of revisions and the flawlessness of the program scripts for transformation. In the case of the corpus of Vidyan and its works, the situation looks like this. The edition captures for the Ashta Sahasri and the Satya Shasana Pariksha are good. The others are often flawed. For the Abda Pariksha Vistika and for the Brahmana Pariksha are better editions available than those that were initially captured. For most work, the capture for most work, the capture was satisfactory in the sense that the text was entered by people that could read Devanagari but did not understand Sanskrit. This focus on mere copying was distorted for the Satyashasana Pariksha as the copist was me. Here the text may give sense, but the textual resource does not conform to any existing edition of the text. It is for now not clearly indicated in the resource which readings are mine and which are that of Gokula, of Gokula Chandra Jain. The methodic approach to correct this is the usage of markup to indicate my deviating readings. I am currently applying this approach in my study of the quotations in the Tattva Arta Shloka Vartika Alankara. In this excerpt from Manoho, Manohalal's edition, for example, we find the readings Matavyam and Bahaspatyadi. I think the readings Mantavyam and Brihaspatiyadi are better and mark the text accordingly in the resource file. In the transformation of the resource, the text can be rendered according to the desired perspective, either in the original attestation or in the corrected version. With this approach and the systematic inclusion of variants from other sources, the digital text resource could eventually become the basis for a new edition of the work. The indication of variants is one kind of markup I use. I employ another kind systematically in order to analyze the dialogic structure of the argumentation. The passages highlighted in green and brown here are elements that signify octavial distance to the conceptual content to which they refer. That is, the, the text highlighted in red here. The passages in red are thus potential quotations, and these passages or the variations may be found in other works of the philosophical literature. The identification of such potential intertextual elements the analysis and the documentation are the main motives why I am engaged in the technological method which I presented today. These features will soon be implemented on the site, but in closing I want to sum up the functionality in its current stage of development. I recommend the following usage. Search for a term. Note the reference for a passage of interest. Look up the siglium in the list of works and click on the name of work for an overview of the available sources. This overview contains the bibliographic information for the captured edition, a link to a digital image resource for the captured edition, a link to the digital text resource and links to available transformations. I hope I could steal your interest and thank you very much for the for your attention. All right, so uh, I wanted uh, to present this, of course, together with Cornelius Krumpelmann, uh, a collaborator, main collaborator on this project, but he asked me uh, to do it my, myself, which is in a way a pity because he is uh, more familiar with many aspects of the database. Um, however, I say something about the overall framework and uh, playing around here with the various you know slideshow. Good. Okay, so uh, this uh, project has been uh, well advertised in the newsletter and, and so on. 
Um, it, I say a little bit about the background. Uh, it emerged basically from the CLUT project, which uh, I think most of you are now familiar with. And uh, I refrain from reading uh, the uh, abstract, which gives a lot of information, which is published in the newsletter. Um, and uh, for those of you who are interested in the more general background and questions. But here you see one uh, edited page of Klutz's work. Um, it is not uh, extremely well legible, but uh, you can see under certain keywords there are, uh, I mean, these are names of uh, people, places, um, uh, texts, etc., uh, but mainly uh, people. You can see uh, a, a number of historical data with references in secondary literature, i.e. we have here a catalogue of catalogues of names. And uh, um, you need, in other words, to follow uh, the references uh, to the uh, first catalogues and then uh, follow, if need be, uh, the references in these catalogues, which lead you to a certain manuscript library if these things are unpublished. And then you have to look at the manuscript if you really want to get original historical information. So these are meta search engines, if you like, of the, of the old uh, 19th century uh, research culture. And uh, obviously this was created to facilitate uh, biobibliographical research, historical research uh, in, in Jaina studies. And similar work was done in other fields. And actually Klatt, of course, was part of the Wilhelmenic period's mega projects uh, situated in Berlin. And uh, the main uh, inspiration may have been the Prosopographia Imperii Romani project by Momsen. That was started, as you can see, uh, by this application in 1874. Klatt uh, stopped his work, had to stop it, almost completed in 1892. So much of his work was uh, uh, falling into the post Mommsen uh, uh, project idea. And uh, of course, the, uh, uh, the, the, the Latin prosopography uh, uh, was completed only a few years ago. It took 120 years or so. Uh, for various reasons, you know, war uh, interruptions and this and that. But uh, Klatt was a student also of Mommsen's. This, uh, I think, is one of the reasons one, one can, why one can assume that his onomasticon was also uh, somewhat influenced by uh, this approach, i.e. Uh, transferring approaches, methodological approaches, from um, uh, the study of Greek and Roman classical literature, the history that is embedded in these uh, texts and inscriptions in particular to the field of Jaina studies. Uh, the manuscripts arrived in Berlin at the time from India, Jain manuscripts, etc., etc. So I, I think, although we have no evidence for it, there's good reason for believing that uh, the Jainological approach that Klatt started um, was uh, based on this uh, paradigm. Now, there are a number of prosopographical uh, projects that uh, have built on the pier. Uh, some of them are uh, very famous. Uh, and I listed them here, you know, in France, here in the UK, and uh, uh, many are still ongoing. These are really mega projects. One tries to build up a data uh, uh, collection of all the information that is available to be able to establish cross-links between people, places, texts, etc. And as you can see, many of those are now um, using electronic databases. And uh, the Jaina Prosopography project is a, a variant uh, of that. Um, there are a number of uh, projects that use databases in Indological studies, or let us say South Asian uh, history studies. Indology is rather a limited field within that. And uh, I just want to highlight why the prosopographical approach 
is uh, slightly different, the one we chose. Um, in, initially, it was suggested by Dominic Vujastic and other people, you know, why don't you put the JANA data, which have been published and, and CLAT, etc., and not into Pandit, the uh, web-based uh, database of uh, Yigal Bronner and uh, collaborators now based in Jerusalem. Originally, it was based on the Pollock project, which produced three, 400 entries. Um, however, the database is mainly bibliographical. If you look at it, uh, they imported the Potter uh, bibliographies, etc. Um, it doesn't give any information on, on history, uh, on the contents of the text, uh, let us say. There are a number of other projects that are ongoing. These are all ongoing projects. Uh, Himal Trika's approach is uh, path-breaking. However, uh, it's very interesting uh, if you juxtapose the two approaches, uh, the TEI, the XML approach, by looking into the text and disseminating uh, or discriminating between uh, different elements from the prosopographical approach, which is more sociological and less philologically oriented. So you can use digital humanities technology, modern analytical technology, for a variety of different um, aims. Uh, Michael Willis here has started a wonderful project on inscriptions, and I just recently uh, uh, discussed in greater depth with one of the, the main contributors how the SIDM uh, web page is supposed to work. Uh, again, a, a different approach uh, for the study of inscriptions. So there are a variety of existing um, uh, research projects which are rather big. Um, my talk here can be short, and I hope uh, Jay will stop me at 25 minutes past because we have a five-minute book launch at the end. Um, I, re I refer you to these texts uh, which are which give ample information on all the background details um, and uh, will be available in, in due course um, to everyone. And I, amongst the speakers, I uh, disseminated them already. Now, what are the tasks of the prosopography? Um, we had to create a data model and a database first, and that took up uh, a good part of last year. And. Uh, now, uh, data input is our main concern. And of course, the more data you put in, the more links you can investigate between the uh, uh, elements. And uh, later, one can present the data, display them in different formats, and analyze them with electronic um, analytical technology. Um, just to give you an idea who is working on it, a very uh, Grateful that recently uh, uh, two um, uh, new members have uh, volunteered, as it were, Samani Pratipa Prake here is at SOAS and from Ladnun, and uh, Simon Wienand from Ghent University. There, um, he's here, for, for, will be here for three months, uh, and uh, um, associated uh, uh, individuals from different organizations are mentioned there, and there will be more. One of the reasons why I present this here is to really, like the old, uh, the, the other prosopography projects which I uh, indicated before, you know, on the, uh, Greek and Roman materials, um, to uh, call upon a collaboration as far as uh, data input is concerned, and the use of the database once it out, it's going out of our hands after the end of a three-year uh, research period. Then the tool is uh, developed. It will be well stocked with information. But the more information uh, people put in and the more use is made of the uh, tools of the web page uh, base itself, uh, the better. OK, technical support is from Digital Humanities uh, Sheffield. If you go to that web page, you will find they have and many, many uh, uh, similar projects, mostly on um, European materials, such as uh, nunneries in the UK and so on and so forth. A very and, uh, uh, fantastic web resources there. Okay, now I, um, 
if I click on this, I will it. Okay, yes, I have to. And now we'll get on this database. Oops. Sorry. Okay, let's hope we are ending up there. <laughs> of course not. Um, cannot download the information you requested. Um, let me go straight to the... Uh, to the web and put it in here. I mean, this is in, uh, is not yet publicly accessible because there is no um, um, int, uh, web face uh, and display features are not there. And unfortunately, we have this rather complicated uh, um, access code. Forgive me for this. But it will all be worthwhile. <laughs> I have to do that again, but then it will work. Um, well, this is what I try to do. I should now. Yes, uh, yes. You, this is what I intended to do, and it actually <coughs> works. Right. I mean, on my computer, I have it bookmarked. Okay. So this is how it looks like at the moment, a very basic, basic. and if we click on this, you uh, see here, this is most important. I mean, basically here, uh, there are bibliographical references uh, hidden under, under this category. Um, here, uh, that relates to persons, and the taxonomies are most important. I mean, here you see the different categories broadly in an overview, and you, you can click on one or other, and you see subcategories. And to develop them, that was, of course, uh, the main intellectual uh, task as far as the web, the data uh, model is concerned. So uh, let us just to, uh, if we want, I mean, it's very simple cast. Of course, we, we have a few casts, but there may be more. Um, as you type in um, a new item, it will automatically add be added to the list. And um, yes. Is that legible? Okay. As I said, the display features which uh, Himal had already in his uh, database are not yet there. But uh, so you have uh, different different types of. Categories, of course, you have uh, the Indian calendars, uh, uh, all these things, different calendars. Uh, difficult is the category of honorifics and epithets, um, how to distinguish them from, from uh, by names and nicknames and titles. I mean, that really needs, um, we have established some editorial rules uh, for this. Um, how to classify that is really a matter of interpretation. But many of these things are relatively uh, straightforward, but there are uh, a lot of uh, variations there. Um, okay, uh, well, this is, uh, I mean, there are hundreds of different categories, and they emerge by, through the analysis of the materials. Now, uh, let me go back and... Uh, to person. So, uh, generic name. Um, there, there are a number of monks' uh, names, mainly monks' names, that have already been put in, about a, a thousand and something already. And if you click on any one, but I think we had one example in particular. Um, 
not sure we can find this without diacritics, but let us hope so, yes. Ananda Vimala, for instance, this may be one single person. Um, we discriminate uh, strictly uh, according to the data. Whatever is uh, presented separately, we we'll simply uh, put in accordingly. So um, many of the data are hidden, but if you click here on the uh, person um, features, this male belongs to the Tapagacha, um, life events, I mean, on each category you can click, and if you get a full display, I mean, this is, uh, uh, adds up to a whole page. Hmm? Yeah, we, we do that later, <laughs> privately. I mean, here uh, you see the uh, relationships in the data, and this is all from one single source of CLUT, of course, which is already a meta source. And, uh, uh, as far as the CLUT data are concerned, we simply put the CLUT page in, so it adds one more level to the whole um, uh, uh, edifice. Um, sure. Um, so this is uh, one, and uh, um, if you follow the links, you find the, uh, uh, the references for it. And uh, this is really, uh, because we have no display function, it is not, uh, not so good. But uh, the, um, if you put the, the data in, uh, it's slightly, of course, uh, complicated um, because of the mass of categories. However, um, you see here, um, And the sources are all there, the works, etc. I cannot display this on this small uh, screen. Uh, very important are, of course, uh, the event and uh, role categories, the monastic relationships, preceptor, all these things. And the, the roles, once the data are there, one can, uh, of course, uh, construct lineage diagrams or whatever by analytical software, etc., etc. I mean, just to give you an idea how uh, broadly this um, uh, structure is, and um, it is a very complex uh, um, uh, database which can basically link everything with everything. Uh, triple store. It looks mainly at the relationships, and uh, I'll give you an example, then it will be easier. So Abhaya Deva, I skip this, but I move uh, to the, um, well, this is for in the clutch, uh, Amananda Vimala, which we just looked at, and you can see the other individuals that are flagged up in this meta source and uh, how they're related, you know, he's a preceptor, etc., etc. All these links are not in CLUT, you know. You have to add another level of analytical uh, 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 effort to find out the interrelationships between those. And this is just a tool for historians then to use. Um, so Abhaya Deva, um, again, uh, there may be mistakes uh, as CLUT notes, and these can be found out by actually looking at the data. We are not merging things, uh, but discriminate as much as possible. So there are 12, no, 10 Abhaya Devas. The first one is ruled out by Clad, probably um, not uh, an Abhaya Deva, but an, uh, another one, and so on. And how to differentiate between them? There are different historical information in one or other source, and you have to interlink all these things. They are published data, remember. This, the information is already known, but everyone I confronted with the CLUT uh, or who reported back said, you know, this thing is 150 years old. And I found so many things, even in my particular field, uh, which I'm studying for 10 years, uh, which I didn't know yet. Simply by putting information that is out there, scattered all over in the literature together. 
And this is what such a database can do now much better, of course, than a single librarian such as CLUT, an Indological librarian. Now, uh, looking at this inscription which CLUT actually uh, worked on, um, uh, that uh, I think makes the use uh, immediately uh, clear. Uh, he transliterated the inscription and uh, uh, translated it uh, with a question mark, and so there are variants, is it Sudaka or Suvaka, in, and uh, then he followed up, tried to find out who these people are, etc. And you find in Clut uh, a number of other uh, entries. So he, he those go, Allah is the father uh, and his wife Singara. So he has, the Clut has an entries for these separate entries here, Singara D and Allah. And some information is from other sources from outside the um, inscription here in blue. And they all fit together to get, uh, produce a composite picture. So if you, if you lose the, use the clut itself, the single inscription leads to so many different other keywords. And uh, it would take you quite a long time to actually find out even the implications within the clut material um, of that single inscription, um, which looks rather trivial, but if you have uh, thousands of those, and you know they do exist. Uh, many of those medieval have a lot of interesting information about donors um, and uh, uh, preceptors, monks who did pratishta of these items. Then you get an interesting uh, uh, database for historical research. Uh, colophons of texts, of course, are similarly significant. And, uh, um, well, this is the outline of the project. Uh, the categories are uh, our contribution, the database uh, developed with uh, Sheffield, our contribution, but uh, the data, uh, I hope, uh, can be put in by others as well. And uh, in the end, uh, um, data analysis, everyone can do himself or herself. Um, there is analytical software out there, of course, network uh, visualization or uh, statistics or, you know, God knows what. There's a whole catalog and we will have on the web page a, a number of those features um, once it's finished in a couple of years and do a few case studies which illustrate the use in uh, specific historical research of this tool. And then we hand it over to you, free to use. And uh, I hope we find collaborators. Thank you, Peter. We are very. So what should I say? I mean, well, you, you. Okay, so I mean, we are waiting for the real uh, book to come very soon. But at the moment, uh, the book about which we are talking is uh, there only in the form of a PDF. And these are the proceedings of the Jane Studies panels, uh, which were organized during the World Sanskrit Conferences in uh, Kyoto and Bangkok. So a selection of these papers have been published in this uh, uh, volume. And uh, so I don't know if there is another. Yeah, you can see yeah, here the, the table there. of contents. Yeah, yeah, further down. Yeah. Yeah, so the um, papers are organized in three sections, canonical texts, philosophy, and literature and history. And as you see from the names uh, in the table of contents, there are both, uh, let us say, uh, confirmed scholars, but also some new uh, people uh, from different countries in the world, especially from Japan, uh, who have written in this uh, volume. And so uh, we think that, I mean, the, we hope that it will bring uh, interesting contributions uh, on different uh, areas, and that's all. <laughs> but then I, I don't know, I mean, this is, yeah, and the first, um, first part of Jane prosopography is uh, there, present with a very long article by Peter. 
<laughs> but then I don't know because we are launching a book which does not exist. Um, I mean, which is not there. But I understand that there are other books which exist, so they also have to be launched. No? They will be launched after lunch. Ah, okay, okay, <laughs> good, <laughs> good. So that's all. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>